um, I'm Berna, and I'm extremely jet lagged. I didn't get any sleep last night, so if I make any mistakes or don't make sense, it's not me. It's just the time zones. Um, so I want to just thank the organizers I mean, for the event, but also for this ingenious ordering of presentations, because I feel like I'm only here just to be the transition between Ivan and Danielle's presentation, because I'm going to take it from one to the other. It's awesome. So we'll see. Um, I'm going to present to you today our research, a um, cross-disciplinary research that we, done a, we did as an interdisciplinary team on a well, cross-disciplinary topic, I'd say. And uh, I was lucky to work with uh, great colleagues on this one. Two of them are here. I worked with um, Erkan, who's a statistician. He's somewhere around here. And uh, Gustavo is there. He's our uh, computer scientist. And Bert couldn't make it here. And he's our philosopher. And I'm from the business school originally, but my um, background is consumer behavior and statistics. So it's a. Uh, we came together, we were interested in this idea of reproducibility, but we wanted to understand it from a more theoretical perspective. So the, I call this um, my talk toward a theory of scientific discovery and reproducibility. It's not there yet, we're going towards it. Um, so I'll present a combination of two different projects kind of combined and it's going to be a lot of things and I'm going to take you through history and then some um, thought experiments and then some simulations. There's going to be a whole lot of things. So I'll start with a historical overview. It's not going to overlap with what um, Ivan presented. Ours is a little bit more generic about the history of science, but we wanted to just track this idea of reproducibility and see how far back we can go. Typically when um, in a lot of recent papers, when you see reproducibility or the history of reproducibility mentioned, um, they go back to Popper, um, but that's kind of given. But if you kind of find a few other exceptional papers that they talk about the early modern era, which is Francis Bacon and onwards. So we were curious what we could learn from this history, but first, I was just, I wanted to know, like, how far back do these ideas go? Because we keep talking about science needs reproducibility, science needs these replications, but how do we know that? Who first noticed that we needed these things? So our research kind of led into, led us into this deep um, historical hole. I found myself in my hometown, well, my family hometown, basically, um, Pergamon with Galen. Galen of Pergamon from um, second century. He's a, he was a Roman uh, physician, very famous one at the time um, in the Roman Empire. And he was doing a lot of medical experiments and medical studies. Um, he was very meticulous in his work. And um, his idea was that don't ask me, don't take my word for it. If, if I tell you something um, as a scientific fact, don't take my word for it. I'm going to tell you what I did, and you can do it yourself. And that's how it should be. And he kind of taught his people to do that. And his idea was that after his passing, people should be able to do the same things. If they followed in his footsteps, they would come up with the same answers. Um, after that, we find a lot of thoughts that we know about um, scientific method nowadays also go back to the golden era of Islamic science, um, Islamic scholars of 10th century, 11th century. So Avicenna, also known as um, Ibn Sina in the um, Islamic world, has also done a lot of work on the um, scientific process. And he also found himself saying similar things to Galen uh, after eight, nine centuries after him. Um, Avicenna thought that, okay, the medical findings that I have, you should be able to actually do the same experiments. And that's the only way you know that I'm telling the truth. Otherwise, there's no other way of knowing. So these concerns about replicating experiments and reproducing the results of these experiments 
goes way back um, before the early modern period. Then we came to um, Roger Bacon, so not Francis Bacon, this is Roger Bacon, is a um, medieval scholar and philosopher, um, English philosopher. He was one of the, I think, uh, precursors of this current open science movement. Um, what Roger Bacon did was, he was keeping extreme records of everything that he did um, scientifically. He did a lot of optical experiments. He was really um, keeping a log of everything. And he thought that you know, the core of what we should do, how we learn things, is that we just share things. Science is done collaboratively, and everyone should learn from what I did. So I should be really very precise in how I explain everything to other people. So the open and collaborative idea um, behind, behind science <coughs> seemed like a plausible solution to find, you know, to create a reproducible science back then. <coughs> so who else worried about reproducibility? We come to a little bit more closer, um, 17th century, um, 16th, 17th century, Da Vinci, well, before that, actually, Alberini also from the um, Islamic Golden Age, he um, had this idea that reproducing experiments has something to do with truth. Only by reproducing experiments can we actually come up with facts. Before other people do the same experiments and find the same results, we cannot conclude that something is a fact. Um, da Vinci had the similar idea, which is kind of exemplified by this quote. Uh, before making of this, uh, before making of this case a general rule, make trial of it two or three times, observing whether the experiments produce each time the same effects. And he even took it a little bit further. He talked about what we call nowadays conceptual experiments. He discussed that we should actually try to test these results under different conditions. So we should change the circumstances and see how much it holds. Um, so these ideas actually go back further than I thought when, before we started um, researching this. So we come a little bit more closer. Robert Boyle, <coughs> famous, um, one of the founders of modern chemistry and also um, scientific method, was very adamant about the necessity for replications. Um, he was also, he took Francis Bacon's ideas and he believed in a cooperative science and the only way that we could collaboratively do science is that we should just share everything and we should replicate each other's experiments and scientists themselves actually should do it very rigorously. They shouldn't give up. Uh, one time two times, three times, as Da Vinci said, it's not enough. They should keep learning from the past experiments and updating it and keep going on until they're sure that they have found something. Interestingly, however, we find some oppositions to this idea that replications are necessary. And we find it with Newton. Newton did not believe that. He actually did not like it. He thought, okay, you don't need to replicate my experiments. I did it once, it's enough. I mean, I have the theory, you know. Why repeat what I already did? And he had a lot of opposition. There was um, Anthony Lucas who tried to replicate Newton's experiments and failed to replicate it. Newton didn't want to hear about it. It's like, don't tell me about it. Talk about my experimentum crucis. I already showed it. You're done. You're doing nothing. You're wasting your time. So it was a, even then, it was a controversial topic and not everyone believed in that. Um, Goethe, about, well, they overlapped a little bit, but um, half a century or a century later, criticized Newton heavily in his writings on um, science. And he thought that, again, like repeating all the previous scientists, that Newton was wrong and replication was the um, backbone of science, basically. We need to replicate each other's findings and replicate our own findings, and there's no other way of going about that. Um, and one of the biggest critiques of Newton, he was. So what do we learn from all of this? I think besides the fact that these thoughts have been around for much longer time than we thought, 
a few things kind of um, draw our attention here. One of, the, one of those things is that a lot of these scientists, scholars, philosophers, were basic their, basing um, their assumptions about science on their intuitions pretty much and their own experiences and you know their whatever they learned from their experiments observations and their own thinking however none of them actually came together to um, come up with a formal theory of science so these ideas the relationship between open science and replications, the relationship between reproducible results and facts that never become formalized, which was something that we thought is still lacking in this literature. Now we fast forward uh, quite some time in the, to the say post 2010 era, the replication crisis. Now we see a lot of meta science studies, a lot of meta research studies, a lot of them are descriptive, um, trying to figure out, you know, pinpoint um, some factors driving the <coughs> irreproducible results that we see nowadays. Um, typically, a lot of them go back to methodological issues that um, some of which Ivan also actually, um, Ivan also mentioned. Um, but we, there is also a beginning of some theoretical work but there's not a whole lot of them. So some of the um, colleagues who have worked on the theory of reproducibility, Mikhail Ries and Smaldino, they talked about the um, cultural evolution of bad science and uh, Nissen et al, they talked about the canonization of false facts and um, Higginson and Monofo. So there's some work being developed to try to come up with a theoretical understanding of the dynamics of reproducibility. But in our perspective, all of these kind of converge on a specific view of science, which is a hypothesis-centric view of science. So the focus is always on null hypothesis significance testing. Um, they focus on the incentive structures that lead to, say, publication bias, the, the fact that we're publishing more, um, we're not publishing null results, um, p-hacking, harking, all of these are pretty much within that they make sense in the context of null hypothesis significance testing. And um, well, if that's the problem, then we should all perhaps li listen to Sander Greenland and colleagues recent call on abandoning statistical significance completely and be done with it. So everything will be reproducible now. That's not what we believe. We think there's something else. And we, this focus on methodological results may be hiding something else going behind the scenes. So our questions are, we, our view is that some fields actually prog progress by building models and developing new models, comparing models to each other, selecting models and rebuilding them. So how can we represent scientific process in a framework where we can adopt this model centric perspective? Um, and also another thing that we wanna understand is how does reproducibility operate at the baseline before even these methodological issues that we have? If there were no p-hacking, if there was no harking, if there was no publication bias at all, would we have solved all of the problems? So we want to understand how, what kind of reproducibility should we expect if none of these issues exist? Um, so we have a few premises that we base our work on. The first one is that well-designed statistical methods are deduced from probability theory and they deliver their claims when assumptions are met. So the key part here, key phrase being when assumptions are met. When are these assumptions really met? Second, there are some impediments to obtaining reproducible results that precede many of the aforementioned methodological causes of irreproducibility. That kind of it's interesting kind of the overlap with uh, um, Iwan's first, uh, first thesis that he presented. It's pretty similar, I thought, when I was watching. Um, and third, scientific process is characterized by multiple properties, not just reproducibility. So we want science to make discoveries. We want science to maybe not waste resources on things that don't make sense. So focusing on the reproducibility 
may distract us away from these other things we want science to achieve. How are these related? Does reproducibility serve these other ends um, or not? So we are interested in, um, we are, these are our premises, this is what we base our research on, and we have two theses, which we're gonna try to kind of um, explore a little bit more. First, we claim that even if erroneous methodological practices of premise two were absent, so there was again no p-hacking, no harking, etc., reproducible results are still not guaranteed if premise one assumptions are violated. So we believe there are different ways we can violate assumptions of um, statistical theory that doesn't necessarily boil down to um, hypothesis testing framework. And second thesis that we have is reproducibility and scientific progress are not always perfectly aligned, which is a little bit more controversial thesis that we have, but we're gonna get to that. Um, so what we want to do is to start out trying to formalize um, reproducibility and open science as much as we can, starting from the building blocks, so the first stages. We use this idea of an idealized experiment, um, psi, as a basis for <laughs> science. So what is this idealized experiment? The I the idealized experiment um, that we imagine has, is based on four key building blocks. The background knowledge, what is background knowledge? So everything we know about the current state of science or our own disciplines. So the state of art knowledge, the current consensus of what is the theory or what are the paradigms that we use, the experimental paradigms, etc. So we come to doing science with that kind of background already. So we know certain things or we believe it, that we know certain things and we base everything we do after that um, on that. So we assume that there's also a model space that scientists can explore. But the part of the model space that they end up or they are able to explore is limited by their background knowledge. So we're not gonna be able to know everything that is out there, so we're limited in what we see. Within the, back, uh, within the model space that we can explore, the scientist in this idealized experiment proposes a model, which is the, this scientist's vision for truth. We don't, well, we assume that there's a truth. That's something I think probably Danielle in her talk is going to challenge me about, but that is an assumption that we make. Uh, we assume that there's a truth and um, sub T stands for the true model that is somewhere. It doesn't have to be in the orange space. It can be in the orange space. It can be in the white space. We just don't know where the truth is. Yes. Can you define what you mean with model in this, in this case? Um, is it a theory or is it a computational model or is it a statistical model? Oh, well, we imagine a statistical model okay. in this case. And um, yeah, I'm going to show um, you exactly how we use it. But typically, it could be anything, it could be a conceptual model as well. The way we model our model is statistical. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a um, true model that is the true ge data generating mechanism somewhere, but the scientists don't know where it is. So the, our guess, our scientists guess is that, okay, I propose that MP could be the true model, so I'm gonna test that. Based on what her true model is, she has some methods that she can use to test this um, proposed model from the method space. So there are a lot of mo uh, methods that can be used to test any given model, but for a given model, we're gonna be limited. We have a smaller um, sample of methods to choose from. She chooses this S. So S represents the, me um, the method in the idealized experiment. And we represent back background knowledge with K. I forgot to put it there. Um, then there's the sample space, which is all the data that you can collect possibly. Um, using the, the experimenter is going to collect some kind of data, um, the, which is represented by this orange space. And then she's going to use the S to test her model using this data that she collects. The data we evaluate in two components. 
the D sub S represents the data structure, which is pretty much like the metadata, what we know about the structure of the data, which is maybe the dimensions of the data, um, it could be the sample size, it could be the um, types of variables that you have, etc. And D sub V is the actual observation values that she collects. Then from that data that she collects using S, the data by the way is generated by the true model, um, she can come up with a lot of results. She's interested only in a subset of results that she can um, come up with, which could be um, parameter estimation, it could be different hypotheses that she wants to test. So in this case, she comes up with these, ends up with these um, M results. So that's the idealized experiment that we have. Using this idealized experiment, we're gonna try to identify formalize some definitions um, that are important for our case. First one is auditability. What we mean by that? We want to make the distinction between different concepts a little bit clearer using our framework. So auditability is our ability to be able to take, look at someone's study, um, check it for errors, look at their model, look at the method that they chose, look at their data, um, and using the same method, applying it the same data that they collected, whether we can get the same results. So it's basically checking whether someone did their job, um, whether everything that they did was correct or not. Then we have reliability. The way we define reliability is um, very specific to the method only. Um, it's the uh, property of the method that tells you whether the method, if applied to the same data over and over again, if it yields the same results. Basically, that's the property of the method, nothing else. Um, and for our purposes, we assume that our methods are pretty much reliable in this research. Because if, you, if your methods are also unreliable, it adds only further level of complication. Um, and then we define replicability as the, our ability to take someone else's study experiment psi and be able to run the same <laughs> study using the same model, um, using the same method, but generating a new data set, whether we are actually able to do it. This is our definition. I know there are different definitions out there. Just want to make it clear this is how we use it. So this is the, our ability to generate a independent data set using the same model, same background assumptions, and the same method. And this will depend on whether this information is available to us and whether we can duplicate the information that is available to us to collect a new data set. And finally, we have reproducibility, which is um, the rate with which we can reproduce the one of the results of the first experiment, let's say R1, with the new data set that we collected. Which, um, so reproducibility then in this case is the extent to which R1 prime confirms R1 or is consistent with each other. It's the qualitative distinction, not necessarily so um, quantitative. We cannot quite say um, with precision what reproduces what, but we're gonna come up with our own uh, probabilistic definition <coughs> for this purpose, but it's typically qualitative. So using these definitions and using the idea of an idealized experiment, what can we say about what do we need to be able to reproduce someone else's findings? We're gonna use a toy example for this, and it's a very well-known toy example. Uh, it's a simple case, but it helps us illustrate certain um, principles. So in this case, we have a large population of black or white ravens, so they can only be two colors. Our goal in this study is to estimate the true proportion of black ravens in the population. This true proportion is parameterized by pi, given a random sample of ravens from this population. And we have two consecutive experiments. In experiment one, we draw a simple random sample 
until n ravens are observed, such that the sum of black and white ravens sum to n. So this is a binomial experiment. In the second experiment, we have a simple random sample. This is a little bit different, because now we stop the experiment when we collect um, w white ravens, as opposed to stopping at n, so different stopping rules. But for our purposes, for this toy example, we still end up with um, number of black ravens plus number of white ravens equals n. So there are different experiments in different ways, but they also have some commonalities. What does that mean? We're going to make some observations and conclusions um, from this simple experiment. This right side is kind of fixed. It just stands there as a reminder to show you that the experiment one is the binomial, and experiment two is the negative binomial experiment. On the left side, I'm going to show you a set of maybe um, six observations and results. So the first one, the probability models in experiments are um, experiment one and experiment two are different because the parameter vectors are different. They have uh, one parameter in common, which is the pi, the proportion that we're trying to estimate, but we have another parameter in each one that is not shared. And the first one, the stopping rule, made the n, the parameter, vector, um, the parameter. In the second experiment, we have w, because we're stopping at w white ravens. So these are different models in this sense. Um, yet we can estimate pi with b over n in each case. It's, um, that is, we can reproduce some of the results of the first experiment with the second experiment, even though the models are not the same. The second observation is that we can find different estimators that will yield the same estimate, b over n, such as the um, maximum likelihood <coughs> estimator and the method of moments ex estimator, which is both b over n in the binomial and negative binomial case. So we can conclude that we can reproduce some of the results of the first experiment and the second one, even though we're using different methods. Um, stopping rules for experiment one and experiment two are different, so they result in different data structures. So you can think of this as, in the second experiment, we fix where we stop the experiment, so the last observation is always going to be a white raven. In the first experiment, we have no such limitation. So the data structures are not necessarily the same. So even though the data structures are not the same, we can reproduce some of the results. Um, so to assess, this is an interesting one. This, uh, this shows you that the background knowledges are necessarily different in both cases. To assess whether the estimate b over n obtained in psi 1 is reproduced in psi 2, the latter must know this result, the actual estimate of the first experiment. <coughs> so the background knowledge of the second experiment, if the second one is a replication experiment, has to be different from the first experiment because we have to know what the first experiment found. <coughs> so we have two further results and these are a little bit more, um, let's say, controversial. So the first observation Assume we repeat the first experiment a large number of times. We can choose such an estimator that is equal to its true value some of the time. So in this case, the true value is pi. We know that in 100 times 1 minus pi percent of the time. And equal to 2 pi, which is really completely nonsensical because this is a terrible estimator. But we can do that. Um, equal to 2 pi in 100 pi percent of the experiments on average. We can do that. <laughs> we can come up with this estimator and use it. So which tells you some of these results are true, right? We can estimate actually, the find the exact true value with a certain probability, but not always. So we're not going to be able to reproduce true results all the time. So these are, again, a little bit trivial um, examples, but they illustrate a point that we're going to kind of reinforce with our simulations in a bit. So the lastly, last one is, assume that we repeat psi 1 a large number of times, and we choose as an estimator 1 over 2. Why not? We can do that. 
if we want to. Well, it's going to be perfectly reproducible because we're going to end up exactly with 1 over 2 every single time. But probably a lot of times that's not going to be true. So perfectly reproducible results doesn't mean that we have actually hit the truth. There could be other things in play. So our takeaways from this um, kind of contrived toy example is that the results of an experiment can be reproduced in many ways. It doesn't mean that we have to have an exact replica of an experiment. So replication can be done in different ways. In the paper, we specify exactly what information you would need, exactly what information you would need to replicate, but that's a lot of detail for now. But I'm going to um, show you the, give you the link at the end of the presentation. Not every component of an experiment <coughs> needs to be open for reproducible results. That's another thing that we show. It depends on what you want to reproduce. It depends on what kind of information or what kind of experimental design you can match to the first one to come up with um, a scheme in which you can reproduce a set of results from the first one without necessarily replicating the first experiment. And reproducibility is not a good measure of verisimilitude because there is no one-on-one -on -one mapping between reproducible results and truth. Um, and we can say that because in this toy example, we are the gods, we know what the truth is. So we take this one step further then. Taking all of these findings, which kind of gives us the boundaries of trying to understand what reproducibility is or is not, we try to <coughs> find a way to model scientific process um, in which we imagine science as a um, as an endeavor in which we build, compare, select, and rebuild models. So we build a model-centric framework to study the properties of scientific discovery. And we imagine scientific discovery as a temporal process, so it kind of evolves over time or unfolds over time. We begin by imagining a model universe. So um, we have to start somewhere. So we cannot imagine a universe of infinite universe of models. We try to keep it a little bit simple, but still complicated enough to give us a um, rich framework to study the process of scientific discovery. So we are operating in a universe of linear models. So what does this mean? The shapes, the geometric, um, geometric shapes that we have represent different models, and it represents the complexity of the models. Um, each, you see there's a triangle <coughs> at the center of, um, of the hexagon. So the, each corner of the triangle represents a predictor. We are operating here, the reason that we have a triangle is we are operating in a um, k equal 3, like 3 predictor um, universe. So the first, the simplest model that we have is represented by a dot there we have only a single predictor in our model. The one level complication is adding one more variable, um, which kind of connects the two dots. We have a side. The elbows that we have, starting from model five, represent the interactions, interaction terms. So if we have two interactions, you're going to see two elbows. And finally, the most complicated model that we have, well, um, the one that has three two-way interactions will have three elbows. And the most complicated one, which has also a one three-way interaction, is shown with a circle, which has a hexagon embedded in it. And this is ranked in a measure of, in some um, quantification of model com complexity. So the models that we have here are ranked from the simplest to the most complex. All of those are linear models. We have 14 model structures in our model universe. We still have infinite models. We haven't fixed the parameter values. We just fixed the uh, model structures. So this is the universe that our scientists operate. The true model is going to be hidden in this. And the models that they're proposed are going to be um, selected from this model universe. We have, we imagine an infinite population of scientists. 
they conduct a series of idealized experiments, as we defined before, which is a combination of MD, uh, the model, data, <coughs> method, and K, the background knowledge, as a function of time, as indexed by time t. Um, all models, so that at any given point of time, a model that a scientist can propose comes from the model universe that I just showed you. And the model universe is known to all scientists. So this is kind of a simplified situation. This is not a realistic case. We're just trying to figure out what we can tell from a much more simplified case than um, the reality. There are A distinct scientist types that we imagine. What does that mean? We think scientists actually may explore or may conduct searches in this model universe in different ways. They may have their own research strategies. So we imagine different research strategies for proposing a model in their experiments. These strategies depend on a global model. So the global model, which we represent by M sub G, represents the consensus of the scientist population at any given point of time. So as our scientific process unfolds, at every time step, there is going to be a global model that represents the scientific consensus. So this strategy depends on the type of scientist and the global model. So our, the A type of scientist that we have, we limit it to four at this time. We have four different scientists who follow different strategies. We have Ray. She is the replicator. The only thing that she does is conducting replication experiments. So she takes, looks at what was done just before her, conducts the exact same study, but collects new data. Um, then we have Tess, whom we call the theory tester. She proposed a new model trying to explore the space around the global model and kind of asking the question, can I take this one step further? Can I understand, you know, can I extend this model a little bit further? So she proposes a new model that is one step away from the global model and pits it against the global model. So she wanted to understand whether it's a little bit better or a little bit worse. Then we have Maeve. She's kind of amazing. She is the Maverick. Maeve was modeled on, um, after the Maverick that comes from the uh, philosophy of science literature, computational philosophy of science, um, the cognitive division of labor. They have Mavericks, but it's a different system, but similar idea. Maeve is the innovator scientist. She has access to the global model, but she doesn't want to use it. She says, eh, well, I don't care about the literature. I'm just going to do my own stuff. I just only care about you know, what I can imagine, and that's what I'm going to do. So she proposes a model um, uniformly, randomly from the model space. So she has access to everything which is, you know, oftentimes recently, this kind of approach is criticized, right? Novel research, like the focus on novelty. Well, let's see whether she's, she plays a role here. Then we finally, we have Bo. She is the boundary tester. So Bo is interesting. She just wants to understand under which conditions the global model holds. So she keeps adding interaction terms to the global model. So she always complicates things a little bit further. Then we use these scientists to build scientist populations. So we have different types of scientist populations. Some of them are homogenous. One type of scientist is dominant in the population. And some of them are epistemically diverse, so equal representation of different research strategies. So using the idea of the idealized experiment as the basis of scientific inquiry, we build this process, which looks like this. First, we pick a population. Here's an example of a homogeneous population, which is bow dominant. So 85% of scientists in this population propose interaction terms. The other 15% are replicators, theory testers, or mavericks. Then at the beginning, before we run the system, there's a global model, which is the assumed scientific consensus at that point of time. Then we start the simulation by randomly picking a scientist from this population. So 
since it's 75, um, 85 percent of the population, in this case we pick bull because it's you know, highly probable to pick a bull, it's step one. At step two, Bo is going to use her strategy to propose a model. Since Bo can only add interaction terms, which is in this case, the global model is a triangle, right? So she can only add elbows. So she has four different options. Each one has equal probability of being selected. So she's going to pick one of these four options. So she picks the third one as a proposed model. And at step four, she collects data. Our data always comes from the true model. Bo doesn't know what the true model is because then she wouldn't have conducted the research in the first place, but we know it. In this case, it's the um, second most complicated model with all second order interaction terms. And she compares her proposed model against the global model using this data to see which one is favored by this data. She does this with one of two strategies that we test um, in our experiments. Either um, she uses AIC or BIC, or Schwartz, Schwartz criterion. Um, compares the two, whichever wins this fight, it gets updated as the global model in the next stage. So it becomes the model consensus. This is kind of simplification for our purposes to keep track of the accumulation of knowledge instead of scientists individually accumulating the knowledge, the system kind of does it using the global model. So the global model gets updated. We come back to the first step and run this over and over. So 10,000 times, um, 10,000 10, steps for each simulation and we run the simulation with different scientist populations and under different true models. Um, simple true models, moderately simple true models, complex true models, all kinds of things, um, using either AIC or BIC as the method. And finally, under different levels of system noise. So the true ge data generating model, what kind of noise to signal ratio it has. So low, moderate, and high. So we simulated it under all these conditions. So it's kind of a big experiment. And we actually do two different sets of this because having Ray here creates a complication. Without Ray, just assume that we don't have a replicator in this, pr um, in this framework. <coughs> then our process becomes a Markov chain. So everything just depends on the previous step. So we can actually estimate these quantities using um, just calculation or you know, Monte Carlo simulations. But adding Ray makes it a little bit dependent on the previous time step, so it's a higher order Markov chain, becomes much more complicated to calculate the quantities that we are interested in. So we run an agent-based model, um, agent-based simulations instead. <coughs> so we have two different versions of this. What are we looking at when we run these simulations? We are interested in certain outcomes. Of course, rate of reproducibility in the system. Whenever we have a ray, picked, we'll look at Ray's experiment and see whether her experiment confirms the previous experiment in the sense that if the result is the same, if the global model after previous experiment and after Ray's experiment are exactly the same. That counts as a successful replication. So we track um, rate of reproducibility. But in addition to that, we also track the speed of discovery of the true model in the system. Um, the persistence on truth once it is discovered, because that's also important. You know, no one's going to tell us, you know, when we make a discovery, no one's going to tell us that it's a real discovery. We need to understand that and stick by it and stop searching. So does that happen in the system? We kind of track that as well. <coughs> and also, in the long run, how much time the system spends on the true model as opposed to other models as the consensus model. So in a stochastic process, when the truth is a state, these can be studied by well-known properties of Markov chains. Um, so the early discovery of truth becomes the mean first passage time to true model. Persistence on truth becomes stickiness of the true model. Time spent on truth becomes stationary distribution of the Markov chain. So are we ready for some results finally? 
that's been it's a lot of stuff. So I'm building up a little bit. Some results, though, I mean, we have a ton of results. I had to select a few just to highlight. Let's see. So this is from the um, calculations in the system without the replicator. So there are no rays here. Hence, we cannot track rate of reproducibility. We, we don't have access to that. <coughs> but we can track all other um, <coughs> variables that we are, or properties that we are interested in. So these ones are the heat maps are for stickiness of the true model. And the numbers that you see in each of these um, squares is the percent of time the true model has not changed when it was chosen as the global model. As you see, I mean, the, the more orange the colors are, the stickier the true model. So we look at it both for when scientists use AIC and when scientists use um, BIC or Schwarz criterion. One thing that we can infer from this is that true model actually is sticky. I mean, it varies a little bit, right? It varies with um, researcher types. Bo really does not have the best strategy. She has the yellow response <coughs> of all three, um, all four. But overall, the true model seems to be, to be sticky. It is more sticky as the true model actually becomes more complex because it's hard to beat complex models. So when you first hit it, no other model gets to beat it. It's kind of expected. Um, and it varies, though, since we looked at um, different, very different parameters of the system. The stickiness actually is a com com um, function of the scientific population, the statistical method chosen, and the noise to signal ratio. This, I think, this one is specifically for a noise to signal ratio of one to four, so a low noise is relatively low. When we increase the noise to signal ratio to, let's say, uh, one to one or four to one, then the numbers drop. So the true model loses its stickiness with noise, which is kind of expected. We find similar results in the sense that um, the scientific population, statistical methods, and noise to signal ratio seems to also influence speed of discovery and time spent on true model. But we're going to look at those in the system with replicators. So these scatter plots are from the agent-based simulations, model simulations, um, with replicators in them. The colors represent different types of research populations that we have. So the grays are the epistemically diverse populations, reds are the bows, bow dominant populations, blues MAVE dominant, yellows ray dominant, and purples are test dominant populations. <coughs> so it's kind of complicated, these scatter plots. What we're looking at here is, um, in the one on the left, we're looking at a plot of reproducible rate on the y-axis to time spent at true model, that's the stationary distribution, on the x-axis. We see that they're not necessarily correlated. Actually, the correlation here is about 0.1. If you were to calculate, I uh, put a value on it. So the time spent at the true model as the global model really does not increase with increased reproducibility. Um, and it varies a lot with scientific population. The most important thing, I think, on that one that I want to show you is the look at the reds, where it's accumulated. All the reds are on the top left corner. Why does that happen? Those are the bow dominant populations. This is our boundary tester. And it's high on y-axis. It's close to 1. Well, pretty much very close to 1. That's nice. She gets very high levels of reproducibility consistently. So there's no variation almost in the rate of reproducibility. But look at where she is with regards to truth. She never hits the truth. So she has a perfect system where she never finds the truth, yet she can re reproduce everything. <laughs> that kind of boggles our minds a little bit. We had to think this through, you know, what's happening and make sure that it was not kind of an um, artifact of the model that we had. Well, it kind of makes sense because of both strategy. The way she proposes models kind of 
opens her up to a only a very specific subset of models in the model space in such a way that she always overfits models. And the, the methods that she uses allows her to do that. And because of the signal that she can kind of derive from data and the model mis specific type of model misspecification that she's dealing with, she can reproduce these findings every time. But since she only <coughs> proposes um, interaction effects, especially when the true model is simple, <coughs> she never proposes it. Um, so that's kind of an interesting case there. In this one, I want you to take a look at the blue ones. So those are the maves, our mavericks. See how quickly. This is the mean first passage time to true model against reproducible trait. So MAVE is what you need to find the truth in the model space. You really need those innovators. No one else is going to hit the true model as quickly as MAVE because she just has no boundaries. She's not really being <laughs> taken aback by what's being done in the literature or other researchers. She just doesn't pay mind to that. She does her mm -hmm. own stuff. You need MAVEs. But you cannot just have only MAVEs in the system because then you're going to end up with non-reproducible results because she's going to also propose all sorts of other models, not just the truth. So we need some scientists there to tell us, OK, which ones are more likely to be the truth and not just you know, random models. So we find that all desirable properties of science that we have looked at vary with scientific population. Um, and the type of true model, like whether it's complex or simple, and the method of choice. So in these scatter plots, we have averaged everything across um, the method and the true <coughs> model complexity and noise. When we split it, we see a lot of um, interaction effects. But really, in a simulation this complicated, the interactions get really very hard to interpret. So I'm just going to leave that to future research, further research. Right now, we're kind of interested in these you know, big picture items that we have. Um, another finding that we have is that innovative research speeds up scientific discovery quite a bit. One more thing, look at the gray dots there. So I'm going to show you another, the last one, a table that we have. The gray ones were the epistemically diverse population. So every type of research scientist or research approach is equally represented. <coughs> so the MAVES, um, these, were, these are the median values of all the properties that we looked at. And these are the um, interquartile range values, kind of a um, measure of variation. We find that the epistemically diverse populations kind of avoid all of the traps in the system. They never end up with the worst case scenarios with regards to any of the properties we're interested in. They're not slow at hitting the truth. Actually, if you compare all um, the first line, <coughs> first row, made to all, um, actually, oh no, not made to all, the third row, made to all, epistemically diverse populations, which is all, it's pretty close to MAVE in hitting the true model pretty quickly. Why? Because it includes a lot of MAVEs. So we don't, have, we don't need a population which has only innovators, only mavericks. We just need to have enough mavericks in the system. So kind of the epistemically diverse population draws from strengths of each of these players. And when you look at the variances, you can notice that the epistemically <coughs> diverse population is going to get you some results with little variance. So we're not going to have high levels of reproducibility here and very low levels of reproducibility next time. So epistemic diversity actually helps you control for these variations and also helps you prevent worst case scenarios in a lot of cases. So we think a way of putting this is that epistemic diversity optimizes the desirable properties of scientific <coughs> discovery even when these desirable properties may not be perfectly aligned as we discussed before. So back to uh, finally to concluding remarks. We find that reproducibility and truth, the presumed truth that we have in the system, 
have a complex relationship. No one-on-one -on -one mapping, we need to really understand these dynamics a little bit further to be able to tell, okay, this result reproduced, we know that it's a fact, or this didn't reproduce, let's be done with it, we're not gonna revisit this again. It's not that simple. We need to think these things and understand what's going on in the background a little bit better. Reproducibility and other desirable properties of scientific discovery also have a complex relationship, which kind of makes me ask, what would happen if we were to put all our incentives into increasing reproducible results? What would happen with scientific discovery? What would happen with stickiness of truth? Do we want to do that as a goal, of main goal of science? Um, our results kind of caution us against that. Maybe we want to know first how these are related and what are our priorities and how do we make sense of reproducibility. And lastly, irreproducibility cannot be reduced down to methodological practices. So, of course, p-hacking and harking and publication bias, of course, we do not deny that those are important factors, but even if we were to abandon significance testing altogether, we're still going to have to deal with these problems. They're not going away. With that, I move on to this slide. If you're interested in any of these papers, I mean, you can just search for my last name on archive or all the information is here. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>